today, dear friends, we're going to look at the question of the papacy and, and infallibility. The Pope, as we have said before, is essentially the Bishop of Rome. From the aspect then of holy orders, the, the uh, Pope doesn't have a higher ordination than the other bishops, but he is above the other bishops in his authority or what we call jurisdiction, and in this he is placed above all the other bishops. The, the Pope then uh, is not only the Bishop of Rome, but has a universal authority throughout the whole church. St. Peter, in his later years, lived and eventually died in Rome, and God in his province then willed that the successors of St. Peter would continue on in Rome as a clear light to the world of the work of God's providence uh, uh, in uh, amongst his people. While the location of Rome as such is not that essential to the papacy, nevertheless, the office and what it represents is essential to the work of God in his plan of salvation for men and the church. Uh, God willed it uh, as such that the Bishop of Rome would also be then the Roman Pontiff. In the uh, early church, the popes would either select their successors before their death or uh, they were elected by the local clergy of Rome. This later changed to a more formal process and what we see now, the, um, the uh, election of the, the papacy uh, or the pope by the uh, elected cardinals. Uh, the primary role of the Pope, then, as we saw before, is to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. And uh, one of the major aspects uh, uh, in this reality is his uh, duty to hand on the faith uh, in a clear uh, and, uh, and uh, solid manner to the faithful. In order to accomplish this, uh, he has been given by God a special gift known as infallibility, which is there to assist him in his duty. The infallibility of the Pope, uh, rightly understood, should not present any difficulty to anyone who believes that Christ left to his church an infallible teaching body, and the church as a whole. And we're going to clarify this aspect. Vatican I explained clearly that the Pope's uh, uh, role is to, pr uh, to protect and to guide uh, the church in truth, and that uh, divine uh, assistance uh, would uh, aid him from error under certain conditions. The Council did not declare, however, that the Pope cannot sin, neither did it declare, declare that he can in no way err, nor that he cannot personally hold erroneous views in matters of faith or morals, but merely that he is not uh, subject to error when he decides or declares uh, ex cathedra, that is from the teaching uh, seat uh, of the papacy uh, papal office, upon matters of faith and morals when he is speaking in such a way that he clearly intends to bind the church as a whole. And this points out for us that papal infallibility does not depend on the virtue or the learning of the Pope. It is a special charism given by the Holy Ghost for the benefit of the church as a whole and not necessarily for the individual, the Pope himself. Infallibility then isn't the same thing as inspiration. Catholics don't believe that the Pope speaks with the voice of the Holy Ghost, and it doesn't guarantee that a Pope will be himself morally perfect or even especially intelligent or wise. Infallibility is a supernatural uh, uh, gift then granted by God's grace alone for uh, his purpose in order to uphold and make known his uh, spiritual and theological truths to the faithful. A few uh, common uh, objections uh, that are often presented to us in the question of infallibility that I think need to be uh, addressed and explained. So a common objection is that all men are fallible, therefore the Pope can err just like other men. Well, it's true that as such, from a human level, all men are fallible. But if that's true then, uh, all men being fallible, then what about the evangelists uh, the, uh, and the other scripture writers who gave us the New Testament, or the prophets of the old law who gave us the Old Testament? For this uh, reason, St. Paul, uh, firmly believing, convinced of the, the power of uh, his own uh, uh, truths that he gave uh, by the power of God, says that if any man, uh, into the letter to the Galatians, if any man preach a gospel other than that which we have preached to you, let him be condemned, let him be anathema. Uh, left to ourselves, all men indeed may err, but God can certainly protect men from error whenever and in whatever manner he wants, 
And if he promised to do so, then he will keep his promise. Why couldn't God, who worked through men to produce an infallible Bible, continue to work through men to preserve the infallible teachings that flow from that Bible and for all time? After all, some of the Bible authors themselves, such as David, Paul, and Matthew, and so on, were also sinners at a certain stage in their life, and yet God used them to be infallible instruments of the truth. What about we can say the question of uh, bad popes or scandalous popes? Since we have certainly bad examples of, of bad popes in the papacy, does this not pose a problem when we say that the, the papacy is something of divine institution? No, not at all, because it's the, of divine institution, because uh, the one who instituted it was divine and not, because the one who has been given this uh, uh, reality, this gift is himself divine. And we can apply this to all the other sacraments as such. Uh, the priests are, are not divine, but they've been given a, a divine uh, gift, uh, the, the priesthood. Uh, they confect, they could be sinners, and yet they can validly and truly confect the Eucharist, uh, even though they themselves are, are, are flawed human beings. The objection can be put forward that uh, Catholics can seem to make... Uh, the Pope seem uh, uh, almighty, if you want. No, we are not saying that the Pope is almighty. He's say, all we are saying is the Pope is, in certain instances, and as a very rare instances, is used uh, by God as an instrument for a particular purpose. But does this not mean that uh, somehow Catholics believe that the Pope can stamp any statement with the seal of infallibility? And the simple answer is, uh, from what we've already seen, no, not at all, since the Pope's uh, infallibility only concerns matters of faith and morals, and only following the, the teachings of scripture and tradition. His office is to explain the word of God, and uh, to condemn the opposite errors, and to hand on the deposit of faith as was given to us once and for all by our Lord and the Apostles. The common uh, man would object that the uh, papal infallibility somehow limits our freedom. And the problem here is that freedom is often a very much abused word. It all depends on what we mean by the word freedom. Free from error or free from truth. With an omniscient God as our guide, and the Catholic uh, mind is freed from error. And that's why our Lord says to us in St. John's Gospel, If you continue in my word, you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But in reflecting then on this whole question of papal infallibility, let us be clear about a few things. The Pope himself is not above the church, in that uh, he is for there for the church and not the church for him. I just want to hear a quote one of the greatest uh, liturgists in the English-speaking world, who really puts for us very clear terms what the papacy and papal infallibility imply, uh, Father Adrian Fortescue. He states that the Pope has no authority from Christ in temporal matters, in questions of politics. Of course, he's got his own personal opinion, to which he, on a personal level, he's entitled to. But, as Father Adrian Fortescue points out, his authority is ecclesiastical authority. It goes no further than that of the Church herself. But even in religious matters, the Pope, he says, is bound very considerably by the divine constitution of the Church. There are any number of things that the Pope cannot do in religion. He cannot modify nor touch it in any way. One single point of revelation Christ gave to the Church. His business is only to guard this against attacks and false interpretations. We believe that God uh, would guide him, that his decisions of this nature will be nothing more than a defense or unfolding of what Christ revealed. The Pope can neither make nor unmake a sacrament. He can neither affect the essence of a sacrament in any way. He cannot touch the Bible. He can neither take away a text from the inspired sacred scripture, nor can he add one to them. He has no fresh inspiration nor revelation. His business is to believe the revelation of Christ, as all Catholics believe it, and to defend it against heresy. The Pope is not, in an absolute sense, the head of the Church. The head of the Church is Jesus Christ our Lord. The Pope is the vicar of that head, and therefore the visible head of the Church on earth, 
having authority delegated from Christ over the church on earth only. If the Pope is a monarch, he is a very constitutional monarch indeed, bound on all sides by the constitution of the church, and this has been given uh, to her by Christ. So, uh, such are the words of Father Adrian Fortescue in his commentary on the uh, early papacy uh, uh, to the Synod of Chalcedon. The Pope then is not above criticism, and that's very important for us to understand. Should he deviate from the faith, then his subjects, particularly those uh, in authority, uh, uh, like the cardinals, the bishops, uh, and the clergy, have a duty to call him to task for his infractions on the faith, not uh, for his infractions in his personal life. And that's not the role of the laity or the faith or the priests either. Maybe the cardinals, but certainly it's not uh, the role of the individual to critique the Pope on his personal life. But as regards the faith, um, it's a whole other question altogether. That's why St. Paul, for example, did not fail to rebuke St. Peter uh, when he thought uh, St. Peter himself was deviating from the directives indicated by our Lord by giving the impression that non-Jews were somehow unclean. Uh, and in this slight matter, St. Paul did not dare hesitate to rebuke St. Peter. And St. Thomas, of course, like some Aquinas commenting on this, points out that it's an uh, example that uh, inferiors, uh, 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 that superiors should not be uh, afraid to, to be corrected by their inferiors uh, when it comes to matters of the faith. What this means is that the Pope then uh, clearly is, uh, as a private individual, able to uh, err, to deviate from the faith. And that's why you have someone like St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, who does, is a doctor of the church, who doesn't hesitate to tell us that just as it is illicit to uh, resist the, the pontiff who attacks the body, so it is also illicit to resist him who attacks the soul or destroys the civil order or, above all, tries to destroy the church. I say that it is illicit, he says, to resist him, by not doing what he orders and by impeding the execution of his will. It is not listed, however, to judge him, to punish him, or to depose, to depose him, for these are acts proper to a superior, and as we know, that there is the Pope has no superior on earth. What it does mean is that the Pope has no power to invent new doctrines or impose teachings which go against that which have already been taught. And that's why here, as a beautiful statement of uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori in his commentary on the uh, Catechism of the Council of Trinity, explains that what is found to have its origin in the opinion of some Holy Father, that is the Pope, or particular council, is not a divine tradition, even though it should be celebrated throughout the entire Church, like we are seeing today. For if we did not attend to this rule, we should have to admit without certain foundation New revelations regarding the faith or morals, which has always been abhorred and impugned by the church, by men uh, uh, most attached to religion. Hence, the sovereign pontiffs, the councils and the fathers have been most careful to reject all novelties or new doctrines on matters of faith, which differed from those that had been already received. The Pope then is limited in the scope of his authority, and that's why St. Thomas Aquinas uh, quite well states that in matters of the natural law, in the articles of the faith, and in the sacraments, he, the Pope, cannot dispense, and any claim to such power is not authentic, but a pretense. And so St. Thomas himself could rightly see, even though uh, the, the supreme power in the Church certainly has universal jurisdiction, uh, nevertheless is quite limited uh, when it comes to touching things uh, which are a matter of divine, law, of divine law, of natural law, or the sacraments, uh, or the matters of faith and morals. And in such case, St. Thomas points out, we are pretense to authority, and this, this pretense to authority that we are witnessing uh, today, and which I will look at in more details in my next talk. And so, uh, uh, just want to end by saying, let us, by means of what we've just heard today, learn to obtain a greater love for the truth and the wisdom that the Church has handed down for us uh, throughout the centuries by those popes, and those bishops, those priests, those saints who were willing to shed their uh, blood for that truth. Amen.